Before I begin, I want to start with a trigger warning. If you didn't get it by the introduction, I will be talking about social issues, particularly sexual violence, which includes the, men the mentioning of rape. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge and make a little disclaimer. Research and statistics use the gender binary, thus I will be referring to it as well. I will try to stay within the boundaries of female and male. However, when I mention women, I want you to know that I mean this as an umbrella term that includes not only women and females and people born female, but also gender minorities that are at higher risk. Keeping this in mind, think about this. In the world, one in three women worldwide experiences sexual violence in their lifetime. One in five undergraduate students experiences this while they are at university. And in the Netherlands, if you are an undergraduate student, one in 10 gets raped. Let's put that into perspective of this room. Let's imagine there's a hundred of us. If that were the case, and we were the whole world, it means that 33 people in this room would experience sexual violence in their lifetime. If we were all in our undergraduate degree, 20 of us would experience sexual violence in the next three to four years. And if we're all in the Netherlands studying, 10 of us would get raped. Today, I will talk to you about sexual violence at universities as a case study to how we can reshape the way we think about social issues in general. I'm Paula Marquina Guerrero, a Mexican student and activist. I've been a part of a variety of student associations that have given me the opportunity to dive deeper into sexual violence and its complexities. And I want to share a bit of what I learned with you today. For starters, let's begin with a definition. What is sexual violence? Sexual violence in itself is an all-arching concept that is not legally binding, that involves anything from assault abuse, harassment, to rape. Anything that involves someone forcing or manipulating another person into unwanted sexual activity or commentary. Now, as we know what this means, we can see who it affects. Well, if people witness perpetrators get protected and victims get punished instead of the reverse, everyone becomes a victim as we create a culture of fear and hopelessness. So we stop realizing that this is now something that doesn't only affect those that are, affect, that are perpetrated every day, but rather us all that support this. Keeping this in mind, that when there is a power imbalance, as there is in any society and any institution, women, gender minorities, and people of color are expected to trade tolerance for these misbehaviors in exchange for opportunities, making us be at a higher risk. However, let's look at the perpetrators. 50%, over 50% of all sexual violence cases are harassed and the perpetrator is someone acquainted to the victim. It is no longer stranger danger type of thing. It is the people you know, the people you think will protect you. Even what's worse, over 80% of rape cases are done by someone who was really close to the victim. If you want to know what's even worse is the fact that some of you might not even be surprised by me telling you this. The fact that it's normalized. The fact that this is everywhere all the time, that we no longer are afraid when a friend tells us that they've been spiked at a bar, that someone grabbed their grab them when well that they were going out or that something bad is happening. We have it in conversation as if, as if we were talking about the weather because we don't know what to do. Which has led us to what I think is like a freezing stage, which I'll introduce and talk about in a second. What is really troubling is, as I grew up in Mexico, I was well acquainted with the idea of sexual violence. I grew up being protected from it and taught slightly that how to be careful, how to be street smart. And as I got the opportunity to travel around the world, 
I saw that it was a problem everywhere. And that even though people were trying to do something about it, nothing really seemed to change. So as I came of age to go to university and choose where to go, I thought to myself of all the stories and the risks that I knew this involved. But I told myself very confidently, this won't happen to me. I'm young, I'm going to a first world country, in a small country, in the Netherlands, a very small university, plus I'm highly independent. However, as I was entering university, I was unaware that I was also entering the Red Zone. The Red Zone gets its name from the violent period that it is. It is basically from the first day, the first week, to the first semester, where the new people who enter university are at the highest risk of sexual violence. So much so that over 50% of campus incidents happen during this period. There's of course a variety of factors that come into play. Not only the use of alcohol, which by the way, in all the reported cases at universities, counted was found in either the victim, the perpetrator, or both. This is in no way to excuse it. It is rather to show that alcohol can be a socially accepted tool that perpetrators can use and that we're not careful enough with. There's many other factors that affect this, but the risk is so much more at university that females are three times more likely to be harassed while at universities than their non-student counterparts. And males are five times more likely to experience any form of sexual violence while at university. This is not at all to say that males experience more than females sexual violence in universities, but rather that males who are at university are at a higher risk than their non-student counterparts. Why is this? It's not only the alcohols, the drugs, the parties, there's a variety of factors that come into play. There's power dynamics, there's exploring new places, living on their own for the first time, not having a support system, not knowing where to find resources, not speaking the language, maybe not even being registered at the doctors, not knowing what the next steps are. And when you start to analyze a problem and think about it, your head might look something like this. With so many factors, con con concepts, <laughs> ideas, that you're not really sure of how to start. It's just a cloud with ideas, and the more you learn it, the more complicated it gets, the crowded it becomes, and suddenly, all solutions can seem just as complicated because if everything is interrelated, all the solutions also are. Which might leave you wondering, like it did to me and I know a lot of my friends as well, can we actually do anything? Is it even worth trying to do anything when it's such a big cloud? It leaves you at what I call a communal freeze. A communal free stage is where we find ourselves right now. Where we're not fighting, we're not fleeing from the problem, we're simply stuck. We understand the problem as it is not a new one. It is not something that we didn't know before. It's just we know so much about it and how complicated it actually is that we just don't know what to do with it. We don't know where to start. So what I propose today is that we reshape the way we view it to know where to start and know where to begin so we can lead to better solutions. Anything in life can be phrased into an institution. An institution is basically an organization with rules and norms that guides people's behavior. If we want to attain social and institutional change, there needs to be a balance between awareness, system change, support, with a base of self-care. Social and institutional change is the ultimate goal. Naturally, it's also the most difficult goal to attain, which is why there needs to be a, such a good balance between the independent factors for it to maintain. And they also need to be well supported. You can't have a structure without a base. To begin with awareness. When you think of awareness, or when I say awareness, things that might come into your mind is researching a topic, going to a TED talk, watching a documentary, learning something about it, or even going to a protest. Once again, a bit more radical, maybe less, whatever suits you and makes you feel comfortable. It's just getting information. 
but it's so much more than that. I dare to say that awareness involves accountability. Awareness involves taking action on that knowledge, involves reflecting on others' harmful behaviors and calling them out and normalizing the calling them out. For it not to be weird for you to tell a friend, hey, what you said is not okay. For them not to take it personally as this is a place where we're all at. We all need to learn, but we need to help each other get there. Which also means that we need to learn from ourselves and our mistakes and our behaviors. This is usually where activism starts. And people say, awareness, social issues, activists. And usually that comes with a connotation of a fuss. Activism is often related with such high pressure because it's people who want system change. One in itself is system change. It basically involves a variety of things. For sexual violence, it could be updating the complaints procedures, having a victim-focused process where you actually punish the perpetrators and protect your victims, believing their stories. It could be having clear and fast consequences so it doesn't become so re-traumatizing and frustrating having to report something that happens to you when you're at your most vulnerable state. It could also be just unionizing. And it's basically the stage where there's a lot of paperwork and going through the process that the systems put in place to attain actual change. Naturally, as you bring awareness and as you go through system change, it can be extremely frustrating and re-traumatizing, and just not a fun, enjoyable experience. So as we bring this to conversation, it's also important to know that we need to have our therapist support. Support relates to being there for each other, to knowing that emotions and difficult situations with difficult conversations will come up, and breaking that silence is part of that activism. Support involves fighting loneliness as people strive to raise more awareness and there you can know that you're not on it alone, that there's people who have your back who feel the same way. It can be having conversations with friends, joining a session of a group support, having some tea. It sounds like a big idea of being the support for activism, but it truly can be conformed of all the little things. When you have all the pillars, you now need the base. And as cliche as it sounds, it starts with self-care. Believe me, I am the first to say this is the most difficult part, but also the most important one. It's easy to get so involved and so passionate about social issues and see how they all connect that suddenly you become like me and you're involved in more things that fit on your schedule, more student boards and organizations than you even know they existed. And then, like me, you realize the consequences of not having a base. When you have the pillars, but they're not built on anything, they crumble. And when they crumble, it all becomes blurry and foggy, cloudy again. Which is why self-care is so essential. Self-care is anything. It can be something like taking less action points, still being involved, just doing a little bit less, taking some time off fully, going on vacation, or simply getting distracted, relaxing, having a spa day, reading a book, watching a movie that's not related to what you work with. And it is in itself an act of protest. And I say this because in a fast-paced world that demands productivity and is focused on effectiveness, when you take a, stop, a step, make a stop, and take care of yourself, you're already challenging the structure of the system and society in itself. Having this mindset and organizing the problems into this structure might make social and institutional change more attainable, the problems less complicated, and suddenly leave us feeling a little bit more empowered, a little bit more willing to take that extra step to make a difference, taking us from a communal freeze into communal solutions. Thank you.